welcome you this morning from Faith Cathedral Church to our Resurrection Sunday service. This Resurrection Sunday is not how pastors wanted it to go around the world, but I heard somebody say this, and I think that there's probably a lot of truth to it. There's possibly more people being reached with the gospel today than ever before. And they're not looking for a good production or good technology. That's not what's needed. What's needed is a service that will impact people's hearts for Christ. And so today as we share the service, that is our goal, to impact your life with Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel and to share the good news with you. I thought we would start the service today with good news. Uh, Harvest Christian Fellowship out in Riverside, California, a pastor by the name of Greg Laurie. Uh, last week on Palm Sunday, President Trump had said that he was going to be tuning in to Greg Laurie. And so he and 1.3 million people tuned in. And they recorded 11,207 decisions for Christ. I thought that was absolutely terrific. I I read that and it was like, praise God. Another good news story. I I know that many of you would know who Tyler Perry is. He's a movie producer from down south. And he paid for, they had senior hour at Kroger stores down in Atlanta and also New Orleans. 44 stores in Atlanta, 29 in New Orleans. He paid for the groceries for the seniors in that hour. I, 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 don't, I know it would be a tremendous amount of money, and yet he reached out there in a terrific way. Just praise God for that. When I was young and, and working out and in good shape, we had a, a poster of Hulk Hogan on our, on our wall where we worked out at. And I know that Hulk's had his troubles lately and gone through some stuff, But I had to appreciate something that he put online, and I want to read it to you. Word up. Can you handle the truth, my brother? Only love Hulk Hogan in three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt. God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down the civic centers. You want to worship actors, I will shut down the theaters. You want to worship money, I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me, I'll make it where you can't go to church. And then he went on to share the scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I I read that and I I thought, wow, praise God. God's even working on Hulk Hogan. Over in the Middle East, in the Gaza Strip, there's a a group. I believe that the factory is actually owned by Israelis, but it's Palestinians that do the work there. It's It's a clothing factory. And the Palestinians and and Israelis are working together. People on both sides saying what they're doing. It's kind of amazing. And uh, they, they have made the statement that they have become allies in fighting this enemy. And praise the Lord. Instead of producing uh, clothing for fashion, they're now producing medical gear. To me, all this together is, is absolutely uh, amazing and wonderful. Uh, Samaritan's Purse, they have a field hospital in New York City in Central Park. And Franklin Graham, the leader of Samaritan's Purse, made this statement. He said, we don't run from trouble, we run to trouble. And I like that. They're, they're working. They had 68 beds. They have 55 of them in operation when I, was, uh, when I last read and the chaplains that they have come and pray over everybody, the doctors and nurses pray over everybody and let them know that God loves them. And, you know, for something, a message that you need to hear today, it's that God loves you and that God loves me. He loves each one of us. 
We've never needed the gospel message, the Easter message, the resurrection message like we need it today. I want to share with you this morning from Matthew's gospel, but I'd just like you to turn with me to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask in these few short moments that, Lord, that each one will hear. We ask that, Lord, that you would uh, enlighten our hearts, that, Lord, we would listen to the Word of God, and that, Lord, that it would, it would come alive to us, and that the good news, that we will appropriate it to our own lives, to our own hearts, to our own families. Lord, we just lift these folk that are watching this program up in the name of Jesus, asking, Lord God, your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's something that we always do at, at Easter. I don't know if I've ever had an Easter service uh, without it. That I look at the congregation and I say, He is risen. And you're not here to respond. But I will respond for you. He is risen indeed. We want to share with you from Matthew 28 this morning. And the word of God reads like this. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see and behold I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. I'm so thankful for that scripture. It's one of my favorite verses right there. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. What a great announcement. That is the greatest thing that's ever been told. Uh, this is the most important happening in the history of mankind. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, defeating the greatest enemy that man has ever known. And accomplishing what only he the Son of God, could accomplish only what He could do. We're celebrating Easter. We're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And there's never been a time where hope is more needed. We, we need hope like never before. You know, I started this service with good news. With good news. But the bad news is, is these United States are leading the world in, in the cases of, of the coronavirus, we are also leading the world, I believe, in, in deaths. There's enough news to send you into a panic in this time of crisis. Unless you know the one who has conquered sin and death and hell for you. I just want to say that again. Uh, unless you know Jesus Christ, the anointed one, who has conquered sin and death and hell for you. I'm so thankful for that. I want to just back up for a moment and go back to Good Friday here. And talk about the price that Jesus paid for you and for me. The terrible price that he paid for sin. There's a scripture that, that so accurately describes what Jesus did. And so accurately describes the, the, uh, what was accomplished on Calvary. It reads like this, that Jesus wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Jesus has defeated the enemy. You know, I, I believe in a heaven and a hell, and I believe in a, 
in a, in a spirit realm out there. And there's an enemy of our soul, and his name is the devil. But Jesus defeated him on Calvary, and the Word of God says he made a public spectacle over the enemy, over sin, over your mistakes, over your failings, every wrong that you've ever done, every wrong that I've ever committed. It was defeated on Calvary. And it was a punishment that was so severe because sin, because the wrong in our lives deserves punishment. But Jesus went to the cross to take that punishment for you and for me. The Word of God says in Isaiah 52 and 14 that His face and His whole appearance was marred more than any man. It also says that he was an object of horror. It was that severe. Why did he do that? Why did he take that punishment that was ours? It was our punishment. And he bore it on Calvary because he loves us, because he cares about us, because he wanted us one day to be in heaven with him. Last weekend, Connie and I, my wife, we were watching a movie that came out, I believe it was 2004, called The Passion of the Christ. And I had forgotten how horrible the punishment was that Mel Gibson portrayed, was put upon Jesus. I'd forgotten how Pilate had Jesus scourged. And you know, We've heard about that scourging for years and how Jesus took 40 stripes. But according to history that the Romans, they, they, didn't, they didn't care if it was 40 or 50 or 100 stripes. When they scourged Jesus, it was one of the most horrible things that ever had, could happen to anybody. And these Roman soldiers that scourged Jesus as a punishment for sin. They were professionals, and they were very thorough. And they would have taken that cat of nine tails with bits of bone and metal in that, in that whip. And they would, they would wail him with that cat of nine tails. And when they would pull it back and rip the flesh out, what a horrible price was paid for our sin. Jesus took it, and the Word of God says that He was on that cross, and He cried out, and He said, It is finished! You know, when we have read that over the years, many times people think that was just, He gave up. That was not Jesus giving up. That was this cry of victory We've won this battle for you. We've defeated death and hell and took the punishment for sin. He did that for you and he did it for me. In this life, many times things aren't always like they seem. And that scene that was depicted in the Passion of the Christ, it was a scene that said Jesus was being defeated on that cross, but that's not really what happened. He was defeating death and hell for you and for me. Things aren't always as they seem. Many times people will lose a job. They'll get a better one. They'll wreck a car. They'll get better wheels than what they had in the first place. They'll be going through a difficult time, but they'll come out on the other side stronger Full of faith, knowing in whom they have believed. I like what that scripture says that Paul wrote there in Colossians, that Jesus wiped out the handwriting. He, was nail he nailed it to the cross, and he triumphed over our enemies. Praise God, he triumphed over our enemies. 
Jesus dying on Calvary was God's wisdom for you and for me. That was God's wisdom. God's a lot smarter than we are. The enemy said, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had they known what Jesus was going to accomplish. I've heard a story told many, many times. It's a story of a man walking through a cemetery. And he's walking through that cemetery at night. And as he's walking along, he doesn't see a freshly dug grave. And he falls in the grave. Well, he tries and tries and tries to get out. Finally, came to places like, I'm not going to get out of this in the daylight. And so he just sits down in the corner, waiting for daylight, waiting for somebody to come help him. Or perhaps he can find handholds in the daylight. So he's sitting there in the corner. And as he's sitting there, he said, all of a sudden, this other guy comes and he falls in that empty grave also. And he has the same reaction. He's trying desperately to get out. He's clawing his way up that side to no avail. And he finally calms down. And in a moment of silence, the first guy says to the second guy, who doesn't know the first guy's in there, he says, you can't get out. The second guy got out. The second guy, I don't know if he had supernatural power, but he got out. When Jesus descended into a devil's hell, there was this evil voice of Satan himself saying, you can't get out. Satan was laughing and death was powerful at that moment. But he forgot that he was dealing with the Lion of Judah, the King of Glory, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the, la be beginning and the end, the first and the last. He forgot about that. The only thing he was thinking about is, I killed him on Calvary. I killed him on that cross. But he forgot for a moment who Jesus was. You know, I don't know what hell is like, and I don't want to know. But I used to listen to a pastor, and he used to describe this scene. And he described it this way, that Satan heard that long Galilean stride coming down the corridors of hell. That's always stuck with me. I can just imagine Jesus stepping into that throne room, so to speak, of hell itself, and Satan's there. And as he comes walking into that room, and when he looked Satan right in the eye, and he began to tell him what was accomplished on that cross, that lives would be changed, that people would become new creatures, they would be delivered out of, out of, out of addiction, they would be delivered out of adultery, they would be delivered out of sin of all kinds. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil is what the Word of God says. He came to bring healing and deliverance of all manner. He came to give us a new life. He came to give us eternal life. I don't know about you, but I think a lot about that resurrection morning. Jesus in the tomb. You know, if you would have, if you would have been in, could have been in that tomb and you would have touched the hand of Jesus, I know that he was wrapped in burial clothes. And I'm not sure how this happened. I just know that as Jesus is laying in there and that, that power of God came into that, that tomb, that suddenly Jesus began to move. You know, horror movies, we, we'll watch a horror movie. Oh, I don't watch horror movies, but if you do, and all of a sudden that mommy will be there and, and the, a finger will just flick. It, the hand will move. 
I don't know if that's how it was with Jesus. I don't know if he was laying there and suddenly, you know, Jesus had a, a, re, a resurrected body. I don't know if those grave clothes just went right through his body or if he took them off. I don't know how that worked. I just know that Jesus came alive. That hand began to move. His leg began to move. His body had been laying there for three days, stone cold dead. Suddenly there's life. Suddenly there is this blinding light and there's life. This, the word of God says there, the angel of the Lord came and rolled the stone away. It wasn't for Jesus to get out. It was for us to get in. It was for us to see in because Jesus had a body that could go through walls. We, we, we find that there in, in different places in the word of God. He had a body that can go through walls. He didn't need that, that stone rolled away. But here's that angel. He rolls that stone away. The, the word of God says here, the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And when they get up, they run and they tell Pilate, he's alive. Man, he, hey, 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 he's alive. The demons of hell are running up down the corridors of hell itself. Saying he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. Oh man, that was a bad day for them. But the greatest day in the world for us. We live in a time that people believe many things about God. Many things. But there are things that that are not necessarily true that people believe. But there's one thing that you really need to, to know and you really need to believe about your God about Jesus Christ, because if you don't believe this, you can't be saved. The Word of God says if you believe, rather, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You must believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That, That is, that's what's required for you to have salvation, for you to have eternal life, for you to have a Savior. Why is it so important? Because unless Jesus rose again, we can't. We never will. But I'm here today knowing that he's alive, that I've been made a new creature. He's delivered me from sin. He's delivered me from unrighteousness. He's delivered me from a horrible life that I once lived. We're in the midst of a pandemic. But I just want to say it was three days ago that I was, I was in prayer, and uh, the Spirit of the Lord just whis- whispered something in my ear. There's been a shift, and, and I'm not exactly sure, and I'm still praying, still seeking God about that. Something's different now. You know, when you're in the midst of a pandemic, there are things like this that are going to bring life into focus. It was 1994 and my dad had had a heart attack and he was in West Penn Hospital. And he wasn't doing very good. And we had to make a decision on what we were going to do, whether we were just going to let things just kind of go like they were or try dialysis. And we tried the dialysis because that was what the doctors led us to believe was the best choice. And so we made that choice. And I remember going to the door. I was just going because my dad's room was the first one in the ICU unit. And as I walk up there, here's these people coming out and they were asking, why'd you come on? And they said, oh, that, that old man went into cardiac arrest. And I looked in the window as they're working on my dad feverishly and I thought that old man is my dad. He was only 69 years old. I'm 61 right now. I know this, death is a certainty for every one of us. Every one of us. The mortality rate in the world is 100%. It's a certainty. But I have a Savior and His name is Jesus. And He is the avowed enemy of death. He is the avowed enemy of death. Death is not from God. 
It is appointed unto man once to die. I understand that. But death wasn't God's idea. He has defeated the worst enemy, enemy, the worst foe that you ever have. We're searching desperately for a vaccine for coronavirus. Jesus is the vaccine for death. And even though that you may be laid out in a, in a coffin and put in the ground, you won't stay there if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And you'll rise up out of that grave, praise God, to a new life. And the same mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can raise you, can raise your faith today if you only trust him and believe the word of God. It's not, it's not my opinion you need to believe. You need to believe God's holy word. That's what matters. There was a pastor by the name of S.M. Lockridge. And he made this statement. Rather, he preached this sermon. I've listened to it several times. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, and the devil is laughing, but Sunday's coming. And you know, we may be in the midst of a pandemic. We may be in the midst of trouble. But I want to tell you, it's not going to last. And Sunday is coming, and this thing will be defeated through the power of God through doctors, through nurses, through scientists, all of that. It's not exactly the way we planned Resurrection Sunday, but it's okay. God's still on the throne. Jesus is still the risen Savior. And the Holy Spirit is still living within us. I saw a senator by the name of Tim Scott, and he made this statement. And I, I really liked it. I, I, th I thought, man, praise God. And he, this, this man has learned his faith from his mom. And, and he said this. He said, this Sunday the church may be empty, but the tomb is too. So this Sunday the churches all over the nation are going to be empty. But praise God, the tomb is empty too. And we can, we can rely on trust in that fact. The tomb is empty. The angel of the Lord said, he's not here, he is risen. Jesus was seen by over 500 witnesses uh, after he had risen from the dead. We thank God for that and we just praise the Lord today. We're going to close with prayer and, you know, we have this Easter service and there's no better day to give your life to Jesus Christ than, than Easter, than Resurrection Sunday. And I'd just like to invite you to do that right now as you're in your home. Uh, just, just repeat this prayer after me and give your life to Jesus. It'll be the best decision that you've ever made. And I guarantee you this, that we have a Savior who has defeated death for you. And He won't leave you in the grave. And you'll have a home in God's glorious heaven. Will you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I'm sorry for my sin, and I repent. And I'm now going to live my life for Jesus Christ. I'm going to read my Bible, get involved with a good Bible-believing church, and serve Jesus with all my heart. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to pray for our cancer fighters. Uh, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we come before you, Lord, praying for each one that's on this list, each name, each family, Lord, that's battling this, this terrible disease. In the name of Jesus, we're praying that the power of the Holy Spirit will bring life where there is death. We pray that, Lord God, that that cancer is being cast out of their bodies. And Lord God, just healing virtue from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. We, we lift them up in the name of the Lord. And Lord God, we pray for the doctors and nurses and lab people, the researchers, the first responders, the pharmacists, the pharmacy techs that are battling the coronavirus. 
Father, we're praying that each one, that you'll, you'll keep them safe, Lord, that you'll be with them, you'll be ministering to them, they'll be encouraged, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, for the truckers, the delivery people, the postal workers, the UPSers, the FedEx people. Lord God, we pray that you'll protect them from the coronavirus. The grocery people, the gas station people, the restaurant workers. Lord, we thank you for each one of them as they're out there doing their part and, and working so hard. Lord God, we pray for pastors and churches as they're ministering today online, the vast, vast majority. It's very difficult, and yet, Lord God, this is our opportunity to do things a little differently, and yet still preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for those churches that are financially strapped right now because, Lord, many operate on a shoestring, Lord. We pray for them. We lift them up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, we pray, Lord God, for President Trump and our politicians that are working down there in Washington, D.C. Lord, may they be inspired by God. May they be blessed. May they, Lord God, make decisions, good quality decisions for our country. Father, we pray, Lord God, for those that, that President Trump has surrounded him with, himself with to pray for him, the spiritual advisors. We pray that, Lord God, that they will, they will get in touch with you, Father, as they minister to President Trump. Lord, we pray lastly for those who are battling the coronavirus, Lord, all over our nation, all around the world. We lift them up in Jesus' name, asking that, Lord God, you'll help them through this, that they will uh, be touched by the power of a holy God. We pray for families that have lost loved ones through this, and, Lord, we just pray that the power of the Holy Spirit to comfort them and strengthen them in these very difficult days. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to thank you for being with us today at Faith Cathedral Church, that uh, you're just with us to celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. And we just encourage you to, to walk out your faith with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.